Hi, I'm Pastor Bruce at New Hope Community Church in Northport. Uh, this last week in our service, we had a major technical issue which uh, failed to record the fourth sermon in the Undeniable series. And we wanted to create something that we could still post online that would help those of you who have been following the Undeniable series uh, bring it to a conclusion with this fourth and last message. So I'm looking forward to doing that right now with you. Uh, we've been focused on the series of messages on the inescapable truths. How do we live the inescapable truths? How do we be undeniable in a world that wants to often dismiss those who are called as forgivers, as followers of the forgiver Jesus Christ? So let me dive into this. Uh, one of the things that I, I think of often in my own life is how much uh, easily the, the fear of failure comes into play. Uh, back when I was an athlete, back when I was a child, back when I uh, was in school, then later on in high school, college, whatever it was, failure creeps in. The fear of it creeps in because none of us want to get caught being the one who actually fails. We struggle with that. It's a great fear. Uh, we don't want to be the one who had just one job to do and totally blew it. Some of us have seen many uh, memes on the internet. I have a few favorites. I, I love one I saw not too long ago that uh, had a, a package of hamburger buns that were labeled hot dog buns. I saw another one recently where there was a produce package that was clearly corn on the cob, but it was being sold for $1.49 as watermelon. Uh, one job, one simple thing to do, get the labeling right, but you fail to do it. Uh, sometimes at major sports events, uh, I've um, empathized with cheerleaders that have gone out there. They've got those signs and they're all excited. They're cheering for their favorite team. And they have no idea that their sign is either upside down or backwards, or their one letter that they were supposed to be showing is not seen correctly. They've misspelled the word. It's embarrassing when we have just one thing to do and we fail to do it well. We fail to get it done. Now, for some of us, that's even worse because we've had scars in our past, failures and dis uh, discouragements, and they can way too easily lead us to the expectation of defeat. Uh, a huge I can't looms over our heads because we've had uh, perhaps a parent or a teacher or a coach or someone else who is important to us just speak words of death over us. Then as believers, we've had opportunities sometimes to perhaps share our faith with someone else and it didn't go well. They rejected us. They rejected the message. They emotionally and socially pushed us away. And in that moment, we feel that great failure. We who are called to be salt and light fail. And so one of the things that that does to us as followers of the forgiver is that it's too easy for us to exchange the public witness of our faith for the quiet practice of our faith behind closed doors in the church. If this metaphor that Jesus used is true, then we must learn to be undeniable. Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. If that's true, we've got to figure out how to live this undeniable lifestyle. This fourth message in it proposes this idea. It reminds us that from the very beginning, we have been commissioned for more. I'm turning again to 1 Peter. And by this time, 1 Peter is picking up in a period of time where, well, actually, Peter's getting ready to leave the region. Uh, after Jesus died, rose, and ascended into heaven, Peter focused ministry mainly in Jerusalem until uh, persecution occurred there. The church gets uh, dispersed out throughout all sorts of different places. He ends up in uh, the region that we would now call 
uh, Asia Minor, Turkey in there. He plants numerous churches. But then years pass. He grows older. He feels a calling to go to Rome, and he's late in age now at this point. But he's planted numerous churches throughout the region, and those churches, like the early apostles, were expecting Jesus to come back right away. And it began to look like that Jesus wasn't coming back right away. And so Peter is almost wrapping up ministry now with some of these churches, and he's challenging them how to live as salt and light in this world where they are commissioned for more, where failure really shouldn't be an option, how to live undeniable. So I turn this morning to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. I want to read it to you, and then I want to unpack it. 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 9, it says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though may, they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is a very significant passage. It's a passage in which we are going to, well, be challenged with four actions that I think help us live remembering and understanding that we are commissioned for more. Four exhortations, if you will. Let me give you the first one. The first one is, well, Peter challenges us to remember who we are. It literally says this, but you are, and then he goes on to say, but you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a special possession. You see, we are not who the world has defined us to be. We are not who those uh, negative comments or those words of death that people have spoken us over us have defined us to be. We're not the idiot, the moron, the jerk, the failure, uh, the hopeless cause. We are not those things. That is not who we are. In Christ, we are something totally different. Because of what Jesus came and did, because of our relationship with him, Peter says, he reminds us, he challenges us to remember that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special possession. I love that. But I need to ask you a question. What is on your list? If I were to hand you a blank piece of paper and ask you, go ahead and write out a list of all the things that you are, would any of those make the list? Would any of the things that Jesus declares you to be in him make the list? Peter challenges us to remember who we are. I think it is the first step in living an undeniable life that you have been commissioned for more. There's a second exhortation. The second exhortation is that we focus on the change. Twice in the next verse, he makes this statement, once you were, then he goes ahead and he makes it again, once you were, once you were not a people, once you had not received mercy, but now you are the people of God but now you have received mercy. Peter makes these profound statements. Now, I know in my life, I am very much more aware of how I fail, very much more focused sometimes on what is still lacking. Peter challenges those followers there to focus on the change that has occurred. Now, I need to share with you that, well, one of my guilty pleasures every Christmas season is I watch Chevy Chase's Christmas Vacation. I find the movie just humorous. 
it's lighthearted. It's one of my Christmas traditions, but there's a scene in it that's very powerful. Uh, to escape the presence of both sets of uh, parents, he's been outside uh, and, and rigging the house with tons and tons of lights. And there's this big reveal moment. The lights are supposed to go on and then they don't work. And he stays out there, still doesn't work. He has a total meltdown. Finally, though, the lights are all working. The family comes out into the yard. He has his arm across the shoulder of his father-in-law. He says to his father-in-law, I hope this makes the season better for you. And his father-in-law says, those little lights are twinkling. And Chevy Chase's character responds, I know, Art. Thanks for noticing. You see, we can be too aware of all the ways we fall short instead of all the ways that we are different because of what Jesus has done. They are standing in front of that house, and you can't deny that it is just lit gloriously. It's brilliant. It's shining as a beacon at that point. It is noticeable. The change is noticeable, and we need to focus on the change. It is. The second thing that we must do, if we are going to live undeniable lives commissioned for more, we're going to remember who we are. We're going to focus on the change. Then he goes on, and, and, and Peter picks up in, in the third exhortation a very unique metaphor, a very strange metaphor, a very surprising metaphor. He actually takes it uh, to warfare. He will say this. Uh, he, he goes ahead and he says, look, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. He reminds us that there is this battle that is yet being waged. There is this daily internal battle. It's a battle for our soul, but we fight it different because who we are in Jesus Christ. We fight it confident of victory. Now, I need to bring out my World War II military history geek for a moment. Uh, there's a very famous battle that occurred in the midst of the the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. The Germans have pushed through the American lines. The Allied lines have bulged in a huge way. Uh, they're barely holding on. In some of the places, uh, Germany was able to capture uh, troops, companies, even regiments, and surround them in a given area. And that occurred in a place called Bestone. In Bestone, the 101st Airborne is totally trapped. The city is entirely surrounded by German troops. Eventually, they bring to the commanding officer, the general overseeing every the battle, the strategy in Vestone, and he says, we're totally surrounded. There's no escape. His reply was this. Well, good. No matter which direction we shoot, we can kill Germans. He had this sense that, okay, we're still okay. He had already been notified that help was coming, relief was coming. Patton, Patton would seek to move his army and relieve the surrounded troops in Bastogne. Understanding that victory, help was on the way, the Allies dug in. They had to keep shrinking. They'd lose this section, they'd fall back, they'd have to reinforce this spot, they'd have to strengthen this location, they'd have to send ammunition here, they'd have to evac out into a more safe location. Individuals were trapped, but from December 21st until December 26th, the 101st Airborne held on in Bastogne. They fought the battle, they waged the war knowing that they are would ultimately be a victory. You see, that's how I picture this challenge that, that Peter's making. We daily wage a war for our souls. So I ask you today, how goes your battle? You winning? Struggling? What needs to be strengthened? What needs to be reinforced? What resources need to be shifted and reapplied. 
You see, we're called to be the people who are commissioned for more, living this undeniable lifestyle as the salt and light of the world. I think Peter understood that that began with remembering who you were and then focusing on the change because that's where you focus. That's the story that you tell, what has changed, not what you're still struggling with. But then you keep battling the war for everything that he wants you to be and become. He also makes a fourth and final exhortation, I believe, in this passage for us. It's an interesting phraseology that I use. I, I use a unique thing, and it, 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 I, I want to suggest that we need to practice practicality. I, I suggest trying to say that fast a number of times. Practice practicality. What do I mean by that? Well, I think that we need to see that our good deeds are the reality of what makes the difference. Look what he says in verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that they, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. There is this challenge that he makes for us to live good lives, do good deeds, therefore God is glorified. Live good lives, do good deeds, therefore God is glorified. It is the practice of practicality. It is doing the little things in the moment that make the difference. It is the things that we do in line at the supermarket when we're frustrated. It is the things that we do when someone cuts us off in traffic. It is the thing that we do when we see someone else being treated in an unjust, unfair way. It is the things that we do when a neighbor needs help. It's the things that we do when we see someone who is just overwhelmed by grief or sorrow or sickness. It is the practical little things that we do. Live good lives. Do good deeds. That God is glorified. Practice practicality. So I ask one last question of you today. Will you do the little things today that will make the big difference down the road? Peter, writing to churches in a region that were coming to grips with the fact that not only might Jesus tarry much longer, but that Peter might soon be leaving them, how would they live as salt and light in the world? Peter saw those followers as commissioned for more. That entailed remembering who you are, focusing on the change, fighting the daily battle, practicing practicality. It's a part of how we live undeniable lives. I'm Pastor Bruce Rosengata. I'm excited about things that God's doing at New Hope Community Church. If you can be with us some morning at nine o'clock, we'd love to have you. If not, well, Continue to follow us in some of the videos and things like that. Our Hispanic congregation meets at 1.30 in the afternoon. We have an affiliated Presbyterian congregation that meets at 11. Perhaps you're a part of the congregation that meets on Tuesday night at Celebrate Recovery. However you connect with us, we would encourage you to also connect with us in person in one of those places. We find strength with each other. We are called to be undeniable. Live the inescapable truths. Next week, we have a very special speaker with us. We have international workers from West Africa here. We'll be going into a global focus actually over the next three weeks. We will remind ourselves of who we are, not as individual followers of Christ, but who we are as a church moving forward. If you can be with us, choose to do so. Thanks. Be blessed.